If I'm understanding this correctly, and in life there are no guarantees, the Outback seems to be about to roll out a fleet of diesel-powered EVs. <laughs> That's awesome. And it makes as much sense as so many other things in 2023. I'm Tom Kogan from autoexpert.com.au, Newcast Cheap, Australia only website. Card. Outback beard stroking hilarity really doesn't get much more side splitting than this. That is two 75 kilowatt EV chargers spit roasting a diesel generator. You see what you want, dude. That's what I'm seeing. And I'm sure there's a joke somewhere there about the kind of pornography Optimus Prime might download from time to time. But to me, doing this actually makes perfect sense. So anyway, a shit-stirring dude or dudette, I suppose, on Instagram posted a video of this entertaining installation, which rapidly accrued more than three million views. <laughs> Insta-fame, dude. Love it. Apropos of nothing, this person's name is Rural Shit. One word. All lowercase, of oh, fucking course. Some parents, dude, like, honestly... They really do set the kiddies up for failure, do they not? At least could have used a capital R, am I right? Rural shit's inference being that it is entirely hypocritical to power an EV with diesel. And I get that, we all do. But to me, wearing my engineer's hat momentarily, it does actually make perfect sense. It really does. Perfect sense. EVs in the outback are such an outlier, a fish out of water, pretty much. And recharging them with a diesel generator is easy and expedient and simple. It's off the shelf. So, yay, I'm not against it at all. What I'm against, profoundly against, is bullshitting, lying, hypocritical, greenwashing assholes. And, of course, the ignorant who just hoover this crap up. I note there's plenty of people in each camp living in electric utopia. In fact, electric utopia was made for this kind of conduct. It's symbiotic when you think about it. It's pretty obvious to me that there's a subset of EV owners for whom battery-powered cars are, functionally at least, a religion. Elon Musk is their Jesus. He is electric Jesus, or Jesus X, perhaps, in light of recent hilarity. This purported transition, which, according to them, is just rapidly underway, the legacy automobiles, those <laughs> combustion ones, it's all like that, isn't it? But which, in reality, it's going to take at least one human lifetime, and it's never going to be fully completed, it's almost entirely a faith-based undertaking. So you've just got to bear that in mind. And of course, the facts do not matter in discussions with people such as that. Facts are just inconvenient and therefore best discarded if they challenge one's beliefs. That is the modern world in a nutshell, of course. So what you're looking at here is a PR exercise from the NRMA in a place called Earl Dunder. It's south of Alice Springs, but before you hit the South Australian border. Having been there a couple of times during various world solar challenges, I can see why it's routinely a runner-up in the Notable Outback Shitholes Awards. The Nossies. <laughs> Typically behind Tennant Creek, but way in front of Cohen. The first thing I note here is that the lead image for this story on the NRMA's website is ingeniously shot at a time when the solar array comprising the roof cladding of this structure is completely ineffective at generating electricity. That's not funny. Thus highlighting one of its principal deficiencies. So, well done, dudes. The charges themselves appear to be two hastily rebranded 75 kilowatt tritium DC fast chargers 
just like the ones in this brochure, only with different hair and makeup. Obviously, you're going to need 150 kilowatts of electricity to make them both work at their peak at once. For example, if four of the faithful pull in at Earl Dunder in convoy, headed perhaps for Darwin, and they all plug in at once and spend the next couple of hours, I don't know, reading the shortest book ever. Things to see and do in Earl Dunder. 150 kilowatts, that's a lot of electricity, dude. Your house, for example, is probably rated at 11 and a half, like 50 amps and 230 volts, 11 and a half kilowatts maximum. That's with everything on. So 150 kilowatts is about 13 houses worth, all with everything on contemporaneously, kind of maxing out the grid. It's rather a lot of electricity. It's just not like charging up a couple of phones and a laptop, you know? It's pretty obvious to me, therefore, that the solar array upstairs in this photo cannot power the charges on its own. Like, it's not even close. The NRMA's website reveals no data about this installation, at least not that I could find, like the size of the array, the capacity of the array, the backup battery capacity, or the size of the generator. And it does beg an obvious question, doesn't it? Why keep these cards so seemingly close to the chest? Is it because they challenge the green messaging? Like, what is not being said here? So what I intend to do for you now and for the next few moments is to lift up the skirt and then we'll all have a little bit of a look up there at what an engineer might see based on the physics, like the basic applied physics of this and the evidence before us, which we can see from our own eyes using that photograph. So let's start now. I'll lay it out for you. That array looks like it's, I'm being pretty generous, but about 12 metres long by, say, 8 metres wide. It looks long enough for two four and a half metre cars. That's 9 metres with 1 metre at each end and a metre in the middle. 9 plus 3 is 12. And I'd really be surprised if it's actually 8 metres wide, but hey, let's be generous here. 12 times 8 is 96 square metres, of course, but... Let's call it 100 because generosity knows no bounds here today and it's also going to make the following mental gymnastics a lot easier. Incident sunlight, 1,000 watts per square metre, roughly. One kilowatt for every square metre. So that's 100 kilowatts of incident solar radiation. And of course, that's only if the sun is directly overhead, like orthogonal to the array, which obviously it is not always because the sun moves across the sky, but it might be close at roughly midday. Hashtag generosity. In practice, solar panels are only about 20% efficient, even at this ideal time of day. And there's several reasons for that. And they're pretty interesting, I guess. Not all of the spectrum causes the photovoltaic effect. Plus, some of the array real estate is devoted to conductors and other hardware, like mounting hardware and frames and things of that nature. And not all of that ideal photovoltaic-friendly photons, not all of those do their mad voodoo with the semiconductors. Some just bounce straight off, and some only get absorbed and create heat. Like, you can tell they bounce off, because you can see the freaking array, right? Plus, it's the outback, so the top of that array is going to get dusty, and finding enough water to clean it might be problematic at times, and I guess the occasional wedge-tailed eagle is going to fly over and from time to time take a dump directly on it. Clean up in aisle two. So, this array being tremendously generous here, at the ideal time of day with the sun right up there in line with its Photovoltaic anus is good for about 20 kilowatts, if you're lucky. Let's say that four EVs pull up. There's four plugs there, two charges, two plugs apiece, four plugs. They've obviously based the design on plugging four vehicles in at a time, potentially. Might have just looked better for the photographs, but hey, there's four of them there. So let's say these vehicles are not totally flat. Arbitrarily, let's say they each need about 
50 kilowatt hours just to make the mental arithmetic easy. That's 200 kilowatt hours in total. If we rely only on the solar array, it's going to take 10 friggin' hours to stump up that much electrical energy. And that's only if the sun remains in the Goldilocks position overhead, which typically it does not. And those four parties to the recharging, like they probably don't want to be in Earl Dunder for essentially a whole day. Christ knows I don't. If those four EV drivers expect to recharge in one hour, which is a pretty reasonable expectation, it's a coffee and a burger and kick the stones around in the car park and tap one's foot and hope to Christ it's all over soon, like, an hour's reasonable. The array is only going to be able to make 10% of the required electrical energy. Like, come on. The rest is going to have to come from somewhere else, isn't it? Hold that thought, dude. To charge those hypothetical four EVs with just solar in, say, one hour, which is more than sufficient time to see Earl Dunder's tourist hotspots, twice... You'd need a 200 kilowatt array, which requires roughly 1,000 square metres of panels, for fuck's sake. That's an Olympic swimming pool in length and 20 metres wide. That's a lot of shade under there, dude. For four cars in an hour, with the sun directly overhead, and obviously as the sun drops, it's just going to take longer and longer, isn't it? And nights, <laughs> still literally a black hole overnight in Earl Dunder. Imagine that. So we're going to need more hardware. The prototype built by NRMA and linked includes two 75 kilowatt chargers powered by a hybrid system of solar panels, battery banks, and a backup generator. Pretty sure that's bullshit about backup generator, but let's run with it anyway for the time being. And batteries, like, of course, dude, the faithful are going to go for that. It's so friggin' on message. The NRMA has bothered to install four charging outlets in this place. So let's say each one gets used, I don't know, three times a day. To me, that seems somewhat underutilised given the capital cost and therefore especially generous for a typically uncharitable asshole such as me, but hey, perhaps a man can change. Let's assume the design capacity is 12 EVs per day, ultimately. 50 kilowatt hours apiece. So, three waves of four dickheads. And by dickheads, obviously, I mean outback EV pioneers. Every day. Uh, I don't know, 10 a.m., 12 p.m. and 2 p.m., if that's okay with you. Evenly spaced. And we'll negotiate a deal with the sun. Like, we'll amend its contract in that place so that it can be perfectly overhead from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Like 10 hours, dude. Hashtag generosity. It shouldn't be too hard. And let's assume that this is the planned usage every day, okay? Every day, over and over and over, 12 EVs, like 1250s, you know, 600 kilowatt hours per day. That seems reasonable. It's somewhat on the generous side. I don't want to straw man them, right? I don't want to just upend them with the cheap shot. We're going to let their own BS do that in this report, okay? 20 kilowatts from that array that we're looking at in that photograph times 10 magic hours with the sun just Goldilocks overhead equals 200 kilowatt hours. Whatever photovoltaic effect occurs before 8 a.m. and after 6 p.m., we can model that at zero because we're already being outstanding in the generosity domain with the generation capacity of the ray by holding the sun in that Goldilocks spot for 10 fucking hours. Like, it would have to be summer and the sun does not remain overhead for that length of time. And obviously there are limits to generosity and these limits are imposed by the facts. And we are still being so generous. The point I'm making is that it's very generous to assume that that array can charge even four EVs each day. 200 kilowatt hours, right? Four EVs, 50 apiece. The sun would have to always shine and be right overhead for 10 hours every day and no squadron of wedge-tailed eagles taking a dump sort of thing. To achieve this in an hour, which is quite a reasonable expectation for the occupants of the vehicle, 
you'd get only 20 kilowatt hours from the array directly, wouldn't you? And the rest would need to be waiting in a battery, 180 kilowatt hours. That's a fucking huge battery. The blue box being spit roasted by those chargers does not contain a battery that big. The Kia EV9 has one of the biggest batteries in any EV available today. It's 100 kilowatt hours. You'd need more than two of those to do this job because you would not want to cycle such a battery from dead flat to 100% every day. Doing this would, of course, reduce its life. Plus, there are efficiencies to consider, right? Charge and discharge efficiencies of the battery and the parasitic losses from running a battery management system and heating and cooling systems for the battery to cope with outback temperature extremes, etc. A battery such as that is going to be prohibitively expensive, like certainly six figures. And it's only enough to handle four EVs a day, not something like 12. It can't do that. There's no point making it bigger unless you make the array bigger. What's the point of storing the energy from a diesel generator when the energy is already stored in the fuel, right? So however you manage this, perhaps by storing yesterday's photovoltaic electricity in a giant 200 kilowatt hour battery, an array like the one you're looking at here can only recharge the first four dickheads tomorrow, and the cost will be ridiculous. The next eight dickheads, Outback Pioneers, the array cannot help, right? It just can't. It cannot make enough energy. Physics says it cannot because of the way Maxwell packaged sunlight. So this expression they have used, quote, backup, generator. I would argue that this is preposterous greenwashing horseshit. What you're looking at, I'd suggest, is a diesel-powered EV charger augmented in a minor way with a hugely expensive solar array and an even more expensive backup battery. The generator is the freaking star of the show if eight or more EV pioneers frequent Earl Dunder on any particular day. I'd further suggest, and dude, I only attended university for seven years and sat through endless thermodynamics and applied physics exercises, and not one of those exercises ever got me laid, go figure. I'd suggest that this seems like a ridiculous amount of cost, complexity and trouble just to virtue signal. Complexity is, of course, the enemy of reliability, and you're a hell of a long way from the nearest technician out there, aren't you? Also, uptime is going to be kind of important if this is a choke point getting from A to B. So the simplest solution would be ideal, would it not? And it isn't this solution. Giant array, huge batteries... <sighs> Dude, why not just install a simple 150 kilowatt diesel generator that kicks itself in the guts whenever some EV twat with a bad case of Burke and Will's itis plugs in? Like, it's simple, it's cheap, it's reliable. It's effective. NRMA is also considering the use of biodiesel at the site if distribution can be viably pinned down. Biodiesel is a fucking joke, dude. Any suggestion that biodiesel is in some way carbon neutral or otherwise green or virtuous is bullshit. Biodiesel is simply a code for glorified canola oil. Some reality deniers out there claim that biodiesel is carbon neutral because the carbon dioxide emitted during the combustion of the fuel equals the carbon dioxide absorbed by the plants as they grow. So, yay. While that equivalence is absolutely real, it kind of neatly ignores the emissions inherent in, but not limited to, sowing the crop using giant fuck-off diesel tractors, harvesting the crop with same, transporting it to a factory in diesel trucks on roads made of oil, manufacturing the canola oil from the seeds at the factory, which means 
processing them, you know, mashing them up and heating them and pressing them and filtering all the non-oil components out, all using hydrocarbon energy intensively. Then there's putting the oil into containers. You need to do that and they'll be made of either steel or plastic, which cannot exist without hydrocarbons themselves and hydrocarbon energy, of course, and transporting the oil to the generator hundreds of kilometres away, in this case, using a diesel truck on roads made of oil. You never get any of that industrial processing emission back. It's a massive one-way street, a black hole, which is generally conveniently ignored by the faithful. A test by members of the Tesla Owners Club of Western Australia in 2018 using a diesel-powered EV charger developed by engineer John Edwards showed that less fuel is used to power EVs than would be used in a comparable internal combustion engine vehicle, proving that off-grid EV charging can still be more environmentally friendly than driving non-electric cars, even when diesel is the only option. For power. On my world, that's horseshit also. A, what a surprise that the Tesla Owners Club of WA found in favour of the EVs. Who could have predicted that? This purported test result is offensive to anyone with even vestigial respect for science. It claims that diesel is somehow more virtuous if used to drive a generator to charge EVs than, you know, burnt in a vehicle. Don't waste my time. The second law of thermodynamics says, fuck right off on that. It's not. They're going to be about the same. Now, I'm going to do a thought experiment with you right now. So I'd suggest that you grab a pen and some paper if you want to follow along with the bouncy ball and check my data and conclusions and my arithmetic. And I'm going to keep being so freaking generous in this assessment. Okay, so inside EVs did a real-world test at highway speeds of the 2020 Tesla Model Y long range. This is categorised as a medium SUV, that vehicle. It's got electric Jesus's fingerprints all over it. And let's not forget that he is such a, quote, genius, who, quote, knows more about manufacturing than anyone on the planet. So I'm going to assume it's kind of a paragon of electric efficiency, the Model Y Long Ranger. They found the Model Y Long Range had a real-world highway consumption of 16.2 kilowatt hours for every 100 kilometres. And I'm inclined to believe them on that. It's in the ballpark and they did it in a robust way. So let's figure out how much diesel that requires, right? Complete combustion of diesel, you might want to write this down, 44.8 megajoules per kilo. And diesel, of course, is about 850 grams per litre. So that's uh, 38.1 megajoules per litre. And one kilowatt hour is, of course, 3.6 megajoules. So divide one by the other. Uh, each litre of diesel is good for 10.6 kilowatt hours, in theory. Unfortunately, however, diesel engines are not 100% efficient, are they? Far from it, in fact. So let's build a really good one. A good turbocharged, intercooled, direct-injected diesel generator with decent efficiency. And by decent, I mean 35% efficient on balance. That is exceedingly generous. Just diving into this, and this is going to get a bit techy, so your head might explode, and that's going to explain the mess. You might want to write a note to your next of kin now. There's a report from Oak Ridge National Laboratory in the USA, okay, which is a highly respected institution when it comes to this kind of thing in particular, and it's called Defining Engine Efficiency Limits. It's actually pretty hard going to get through, but quite interesting. And it highlights on page 20, if memory serves, that diesel engine efficiency depends heavily on the load. More heavily loaded is generally better. They used a 1.9 litre turbo diesel, so it's in line with the capacity that a generator for an installation like this would use. Okay, so essentially, 
if the array upstairs is pumping and the diesel's not working all that hard, just kind of loping along at 2,000 RPM or something, its efficiency is going to be fairly poor, like... 25% or something. That's at 2,000 RPM and about uh, BMEP, like a brake mean effective pressure, which is an engine techo thing where they average the amount of pressure on the cylinder during a combustion cycle, about two atmospheres. Anyway, not working really hard, okay? But in the dead of night, flat batteries, no array input because no sun shining. You've got four EVs plugged in. In other words, pretty high load for the generator, like at peak brake thermal efficiency, which would be like 2250 RPM or something, and a brake mean effective pressure of something like 18 atmospheres, really cranking, in other words, you'd be in the ballpark of 40% efficient. So 35 on balance is very generous in the context of overall operational likelihood. It's more likely to be a lot less than that often in an installation such as this. But let's continue on the theme of being overly friggin' generous. People always bullshit on about optimal revs when they discuss engine efficiency, but frankly, they're just highlighting what they don't know. It's really more about the load if you want maximum brake thermal efficiency. The revs are going to be worked out by gearing in the case of a car or a governor or electronic control or something in the case of a stationary installation such as a generator. 35% efficiency delivers... 3.7 kilowatt hours at the crank for every liter of diesel that you burn but this is not the end of the story a decent uh, diesel generator like uh, the generator itself not the engine the part that converts crank kinetic energy into electricity they're about 90 percent efficient so that's 3.3 kilowatt hours of electricity coming out of the generator for every liter of diesel you burn now According to evse.com.au, which bills itself as, quote, the leaders in EV charging, quote, DC chargers tend to be 93% efficient. So 93 it is, dudes, you would know. So when you plug your EV in, you're getting about 3.1 kilowatt hours out of the cable for every litre of diesel that you burn in the internal combustion engine. And we need 16.2 kilowatt hours to drive 100 kilometres in the Tesla at highway speed. So that's 5.2 litres, I think. You might want to check me on all of that, but I did it twice independently and got the same answer both times. So if I'm wrong, I made the same mistake both times. I also had a look at the ballpark and we're in it, okay? So this begs an obvious question, right? I wonder how far we could drive in something like a Mazda CX-5 diesel on 5.2 litres of diesel fuel. Incidentally, I chose the CX-5 because it's in the same class of vehicle. It is also a medium SUV, so apples for apples. But it's also clearly disadvantaged by virtue of not being made by a genius who knows more about manufacturing than any other human being on the planet. So overall, I'd suggest that this choice seems fair to generous. The official highway consumption for CX-5 diesel is coincidentally 5.2 litres per hundred. And if you pull out onto the Stewart Highway at Earl Dunda, you're going to be doing better than that in the 100 to 110 k an hour zone. But hey, let's just run with 5.2. Dude, it's exactly the fucking same, in other words. So what a surprise. De facto internal combustion is the same as married internal combustion. Go figure. Because they're both relying on the same process. Like... I don't mind people buying EVs. Really, I don't. I see some benefits to EV adoption for some users in some places. I really do. Energy security, clean air for the cities. Like, bring it, dude. I'm a fan. I don't mind them even engaging in some harmless outback pioneering fantasy in Earl Dunder or Cohen, Timber Creek, Burketown, Warburton, Thargaminda, Tibberborough. We could be here all day, like so many outback shitholes and so little time. 
I'm kind of cool with that conduct, but I, I really, really object to greenwashing bullshitters who seem to operate on the presumption that nobody understands basic science anymore. This installation is a horribly overpriced fraud, in my estimation, tackling the spectacularly thorny non-problem of carbon-neutral EV charging in the outback. Jesus. It's hardly the front line of the battle to save humanity from climate catastrophe, is it? Just install a fucking diesel generator and put some corrugated iron over the top to keep the fucking sun off. Would be my advice. Stop pretending a baby solar array and some half-assed batteries out the back are any kind of solution. <laughs>